So the case I'm talking about is uh, the town of Galloway, or I'm sorry, Galloway versus the town of Greece. Uh, both of the plaintiffs in that case, Susan Galloway and Linda Stevens, are actually here um, today. I told them both beforehand I would be talking about them for the next 20 to 30 minutes, so hopefully I get their stories right. Um, and as you can imagine, when you have a high profile case in which the defendant, the town of Greece, shares a name with a foreign country, uh, it's a bonanza for people that write newspaper headlines. Uh, and so when the US Supreme Court announced last month that it would hear the case, uh, most headline uh, writers actually showed admirable restraint, but the Wall Street Journal could not resist. And its headline read, quote, for next big religion case, high court goes to Greece. <laughs> But uh, oddly enough, the appearance of the name Greece, it, it's actually rather appropriate uh, in a case about the advancement of religion at the monthly meetings of a local town government. Because ancient Greece was, after all, the birthplace of local democratic meetings. Uh, by fourth century BC, the Greek democratic experiment had 1,500 separate cities, each with their own local government. And Plato said that these units were like frogs around a pond. Uh, and, of course, in the most famous of these cities, ancient Athens, citizens would participate in local democracy by attending regular meetings, which took place about 40 times a year. Um, so several hundred years later, modern American democracy is obviously more elaborate and interdependent than its ancient Athenian counterpart, but the tradition of regular meetings of local government units continues. And across the country, Local governments, local citizens not only attend these meetings, uh, but participate directly in their community's governance. Uh, and the, the monthly meetings of the Greece Town Council epitomize this role of community participation and self government. There are plenty of reasons for local citizens to attend these meetings. Police officers attend when they're sworn into office, various town employees are required to attend as part of their jobs. If I want a zoning, a variance from a zoning ordinance, I would have to request it at one of these meetings. Students regularly attend to lead the Pledge of Allegiance, or to receive awards, or to fulfill a high school civics requirement. Uh, and more generally, these monthly meetings are the sole opportunity for citizens to address their entire body of elected local officials about issues that are important to them and to their communities. And because these are meetings where citizens have a chance to petition their local elected officials, and really the only and most direct opportunity to do so, it's especially important that these meetings are fully welcoming and fully inclusive to people of different races, to people of different genders, to people of different ages, and of course, to people of different religions. And that's a question not only of good governance, but also it's required by the Constitution, which provides for the separation of church and state through both in the First Amendment, through both the free exercise clause and the establishment clause. Now, in most situations, Supreme Court decisions interpreting the establishment clause prohibit the government from sponsoring prayer of any kind at government events. In the context of legislative bodies, the rules are actually a little different. In a 1983 decision called Marsh v. Chambers, which uh, came out when Caitlin was about seven months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like, totally different. You were different months every year. I'm sure news, news reached there as well. <laughs> um, the, the Supreme Court in this decision upheld the practice of the Nebraska State Legislature of beginning its legislative sessions with prayer. And in doing so, the Supreme Court actually created an exception to its usual rules. Normally, the, the Establishment Clause doctrine would prohibit government-sponsored prayers. But the Supreme Court allowed this particular practice on the theory that legislative prayers were actually a tradition dating back to the first American Congress. Uh, but even this decision, which created an exception and allowed legislative bodies to do things that are prohibited in virtually any other government context. Even this exception, in creating this exception, the Supreme Court made clear that legislative prayers could not be used to promote one religion over other religions. The Supreme Court made clear that in this particular case coming out of Nebraska, 
there was, quote, no indication that the prayer opportunity has been exploited to proselytize or advance any one or to disparage any other faith or belief. In fact, after the lawsuit was filed, the, the, the Nebraska chaplain removed all Christian references from the prayers so that they wound up being non-denominational. And in a later Supreme Court decision, County of Allegheny versus ACLU Greater Pittsburgh chapter, when Kayla was about six, give or take, <laughs> the Supreme Court reiterated that the only reason it upheld these Nebraska legislative prayers was because the chaplain had, quote, removed all references to Christ. Now, for many years, the meetings of the Greece Town Board complied with these decisions and were religiously inclusive. In fact, most of their meetings in years past began with a simple moment of silence. But things changed in 1999. At that time, the board decided to open each of its meetings with a prayer to be delivered by local clergy. But the town implemented this change in a way that advanced Christianity and Christianity alone. In fact, from 1999 to 2007, to 2007 every single one of the town's monthly prayers was delivered by a Christian. Every single one. And when all of your prayers are delivered by Christian clergy, you're likely to get a constant stream of Christian prayers. And, <laughs> amazingly. And amazingly, and that's what we got at the Greece board meetings. From 1999 until the time that my organization, Americans United, filed our lawsuit in 2008, over two-thirds of the prayers had explicitly Christian references. No other religion were referenced in any of these prayers during this eight-year period. If you happen to be a Jew, or a Hindu, or a Muslim, or a Buddhist, or a Wiccan, or a humanist, or an agnostic, or an atheist, or anyone else, this steady stream of Christian prayers would not make you feel very welcome at your town's meeting. And you would also, based on the circumstances, have likely come to the conclusion that the town government was aligning itself with Christianity for a number of reasons. The prayer <coughs> givers were summoned to the podium by the town supervisor, who would announce the clergy's religious affiliation and the name of the clergy's house of worship. Those religious affiliations were also noted in the official minutes. When the supervisor had a special relationship with a pastor, he would point that out. For instance, he introduced one clergyman as my pastor, as well as the pastor of another, of another council. The prayers are delivered from behind the podium, which feature the town seal, and they were delivered over the town's public address system. And prayer givers, even on occasion, used the opportunity to invite board members to church events. And at one instance, a board member actually used the opportunity to praise the particular church event. So if you were at a meeting, seeing all this, you would not only get the distinct impression that the town was favoring Christianity over other religions, but you would also feel intense pressure to participate in the prayers yourself. The prayers would typically begin with a request for people at the meeting to join in. Members of the board would participate by bowing their heads or standing or making the sign of the cross. The audience often would do the same. And in fact, on one occasion, the audience was even asked to stand for the prayer. And if that wasn't already enough pressure to join in, remember why a lot of people are at these meetings. Many people are attending meetings of the town board to ask members of the board to do something, <laughs> fund an initiative, or oppose a resolution, or grant a variance. And in these circumstances, you couldn't help but think, seeing all this, that if you visibly, notably declined to join in a Christian prayer delivered by a council as a pastor, it might be held against you when the board decided to vote. So it was against this backdrop that our now clients, Susan Galloway and Linda Stevens, stepped forward. And they're both longtime residents of Greece, and they've both attended board meetings for years to weigh in on local issues like cable television rules, plans for land development. Neither Ms. Galloway nor Ms. Stevens is a Christian, and both of them felt that consistently Christian prayers delivered by Christian clergy made them feel like second-class citizens when attending meetings of their own government in their own town. Now, they first raised their concerns informally with the town supervisor, but to no avail. 
And then they then contacted Americans United, and we wrote a letter to the town on their behalf, asking the town to replace their Christian prayers with non-denominational ones. The town again refused to budge. In fact, in response, a pastor who delivered a prayer at a board meeting in October 2007, right after we wrote our first letter, said that those who oppose the town's practices are, quote, in the minority and they are ignorant of the history of our country. <laughs> At that point, it became quite clear that if we wanted the town of Greece to stop unlawfully advancing Christianity at, at its board meetings, we would have to take it to court. And so in February 2008, we filed a lawsuit on behalf of Susan Galloway and Linda Stevens in the Federal District Court in Rochester. And we asked the court for an order that prohibited the town of Greece from favoring Christianity at its meetings. And the town continued to fight, and it was represented by a group now known as Alliance Defending Freedom, which describes itself as a, quote, Christ-centered legal advocacy organization. This was a group formed uh, a few decades ago by a group of televangelists, and it's actually one of our most frequent opponents in courts. Um, I'd say more generally, Alliance Defending Freedom is one of the main go-to groups for local governments who want to promote Christianity, notwithstanding complaints from citizens and constitutional rules requiring religious neutrality. Now that said, the Alliance Defending Freedom isn't stupid. And in response to our lawsuits, the town actually at first tried to create the appearance that it was cleaning up its act. For the first and only time in its history, in 2008, the town scheduled non-Christians to deliver four of the prayers. Even then, however, the town made its preference for Christianity known for instance, although the Christian clergy who spoke and delivered prayers would be labeled chaplain of the month and even receive a plaque uh, bearing the title, the non-Christian prayer givers received no such honor. <laughs> more importantly, though, it became clear that the four non-Christian speakers who delivered prayers at the meetings in 2008 were being treated as tokens. Most of the other speeches in 2008 contained explicitly Christian content. And from the beginning of 2009 until the middle of 2010, when the court record closed on this case, all of the prayer givers were again Christian, and 90% of the prayers contained Christian references. And that's a rate of Christian references even higher than it was before we brought the case. So, despite all of this evidence that the town was favoring Christianity, the trial judge in Rochester ruled for the town. The judge did so on the ground that there was no specific evidence of intentional discrimination by the town against non-Christian prayer givers, and on the ground that the Christian prayers did not disparage other religions and did not specifically attempt to convert anyone to Christianity. We disagreed with this ruling, as you might expect, and we appealed. And last spring, a unanimous panel of, the, of a federal appeals court in New York a panel consisting, by the way, of judges appointed by both Democrats and Republicans, ruled in our favor. The court was very clear that it was considering all of the relevant circumstances, and it concluded that the town was affiliating itself with Christianity. The appeals court made clear that the town had the right to open its meetings with prayers, and that even Christian references were not categorically prohibited. But the court pointed to the factors that I described earlier. Prayer givers who were almost always Christian. Prayers that almost always contained explicit Christian references. And a variety of conduct by board members, which made clear that town government officials were identifying with Christianity. In sum, the court concluded, the Constitution is violated, quote, where the overwhelming predominance of prayers offered are associated, often in an explicitly sectarian way, with a particular creed, and where the town conveys the impression that town officials themselves identify with the sectarian prayers and that residents and attendants are expected to participate. Now, the decision by this federal appeals court was consistent with those of other federal appeals courts around the country. Now, we've litigated many of these legislative prayer cases over the last several years, and many of them alongside the American Civil Liberties Union. There was a decision in 2011 where the Federal Appeals Court in Richmond, Virginia, suspended a similar set of practices by a county board, 
And it did so in an opinion written by Judge Harvey Wilkinson, a conservative judge who was actually on George W. Bush's shortlist for the Supreme Court. We won a victory last year in federal court in Delaware, where the judge prohibited a county board from opening its meetings by reciting the Lord's Prayer. And although we haven't won all of these cases, even when we've lost, there have been factors that made the government's practices more inclusive than what's going on here. Either a greater diversity of speakers and prayers, or a much more genuine effort to find a diverse set of prayer givers. And although, to be fair, the decisions across the country have not adopted identical <coughs> formulations and have sometimes used different language or emphasized different facts, we don't believe that the town of Greece's practices would survive under the formulations of any of these courts or under any of these decisions. But, as many of you know, the case is now before the U.S. Supreme Court. The town sought review, and last month the U.S. Supreme Court announced it would be hearing the case. Um, this is going to be the first time the Supreme Court has considered the issue of legislative prayer since that case I mentioned back in 1983. The court will hear oral arguments this fall, either in November or December, and a decision is likely by next June, June 2014. Um, and since the town of Greece is asking the Supreme Court to overrule the appeals court and dismiss our case, I thought I would spend a few minutes previewing the arguments the town is likely to make and what we would say in response. The first thing the town is likely to argue is that the courts should not concern themselves with the contents of prayers. That in other words, courts should not be drawing lines between non-denominational prayers and Christian prayers or Jewish prayers or any other prayers. And the argument goes that the line between such prayers rests on theological judgments beyond the confidence of the judiciary to make. Now, you might hear this argument and think, well, only a trained divinity graduate could possibly tell the difference between a generic prayer and a Christian prayer, and that, that distinction is impossible for a mere civilian to perceive. <laughs> now, of course, there may be certain Christian prayers that are too subtle to be perceived by a layperson's ears, but the prayers at issue in this case require no such expertise. <laughs> All of the prayers from the statistics I gave you, which, which we identified as Christian, included references to Jesus, or Jesus Christ, or your Son, or the Holy Spirit. Many specifically celebrated Christ's resurrection. One prayer stated that God shows the extent of his kindness, quote, in the life and death, resurrection, and ascension of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Another cited, quote, the saving sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And yet another described the coming spring as, quote, an expressive symbol of the new life of the risen Christ. Needless to say, it does not take the Pope to know that these prayers are Christian. <laughs> <laughs> but remember also that if the court can't look at the content of prayers, then anything goes. Every prayer could be a Christian prayer. The prayers could go on at length. They could promise eternal damnation for those who don't practice Christianity. They could publicly ridicule those who don't participate. Meetings of this town board and town boards around the country could resemble Sunday Mass, and under this theory, the courts would be powerless to stop them. It is impossible, I think, and I think anyone would say, it's impossible to square that scenario with meaningful separation of church and state. Now, second, the town has argued in the past that, look, we can't control the makeup of the speakers through the content of prayers because Greece is a heavily Christian community, and so naturally, most, if not all, of the prayer givers are going to be Christian, and naturally, most of them are going to give Christian prayers. But the town actually has many ways to ensure that the prayers are much more religiously inclusive. First of all, it can adopt a formal policy inviting speakers from other faiths to deliver the prayers, which is something that it still hasn't done. It can ask its prayer givers to deliver prayers that are inclusive and non-denominational. And if it can't find anyone in the entire town of 100,000 people to deliver an inclusive prayer, board members always have the options of simply leading the prayers themselves and making sure that the prayers they give are inclusive and non-denominational. 
In fact, most local governments around the country have no trouble presenting a more inclusive set of prayers, even in communities that are overwhelmingly Christian and that don't have a lot of religious diversity. Yet, in the town's view, all of the prayer givers and all of the prayers can be Christian unless and until the plaintiff can prove that the town intentionally discriminated against speakers from other religions. Now, there's a very good reason why the town's lawyers have proposed this test. Discriminatory, discriminatory intent is very difficult to prove, as well as say. And especially when you are dealing with a legislative body with many members. And so if the rule is anything goes unless you prove discriminatory intent, then in practice the rule is simply anything goes. And while there certainly has been no share of controversy about the specific test that courts should be using to enforce the separation of church and state, the test simply cannot be that the government always wins. Finally, the town and its lawyers have argued that our case poses a threat to tradition and amounts to an attack on legislative prayer more generally. Just the other day, one of the town's lawyers published an op-ed in the New York Daily News, and he said the following, quote, to pray or not to pray? That is the question the Supreme Court will answer after agreeing to hear a case pitting the town of Greece against two of its residents. But that is not the question the Supreme Court will answer. And in fact, the town's lawyers should know better. Our lawsuit did not challenge the town's ability to deliver inclusive prayers. And in fact, the Court of Appeals specifically reaffirmed the town's ability to do so. The question posed by this case is much narrower. Whether and to what extent the town can use the prayer opportunity to favor Christianity and Christianity alone. That is a practice that is much harder for the town to defend, and so it makes sense that the town's lawyers are trying to change the subject. One way or another, as I mentioned, we'll find out by next June how the Supreme Court is going to decide the case, and what it's going to say about the government's obligations to respect religious beliefs of all of its citizens, including those in the minority. You know, for democracy has come a long way since the days of ancient Greece. The Bill of Rights, and especially the First Amendment, make it clear that one of the most important democratic values is the protection of minority rights, including, and especially, the freedom of religion against majority will. With local governments like the town of Greece serving as laboratories of democracy, it is all the more important to protect citizens' liberty of conscience. I mean, no one really ever knows why the Supreme Court chooses to take a case, because I mean, obviously when it decides cases, it publishes opinions and dissenting opinions, it decides to take or not take cases in a, in a bit of a black box. Um, you know, if I had to venture a guess, I would say it's a couple of factors. One is that this, this decision I mentioned, the 1983 decision, had obviously been 30 years ago. And since then, there had been a lot. There have been a lot of legislative prayer cases brought in a lot of different courts. Several different courts of appeals have addressed them, and so it's an area of law where the Supreme Court issued very broad guidance, and then and then the lower courts have been sorting it out um, for the past thirty years. The second thing is that although we argued, and I think we still would argue that there's. There's not as clear a division between different federal courts as the town's lawyers suggested. There are some cases that plaintiffs win, some cases that towns win. Right actually while the town's petition to the Supreme Court was pending, there was a decision by the Federal Appeals Court in California that more explicitly created a split with other courts, at least on one particular prong of the test. And so the likely explanation is that the Supreme Court saw that this is an area of law that has um, yielded a lot of cases in the last 30 years with at least some tension between the various decisions, um, making it a candidate for the Supreme Court to um, clarify the state of the law. Um, you know, that's one explanation. Look, there, there's well, the other explanation is it's always possible the Supreme Court just thinks the 
Court of Appeals got it really, really wrong and wants to fix it. Um, I mean, I will say that the Supreme Court typically doesn't engage in pure error correction. In other words, when it takes a case, it's usually because it's you know, an issue of national significance and oftentimes an issue in which the lower courts have divided. Um, and so I think that's the most likely explanation for why they took the case. The town of Greece um, uh, aired their uh, board meetings in 130 board meetings. I actually, um, Linda and Susan probably know better than I do. I don't know the exact mechanism we captured those, but um, definitely they are obviously recorded in some form that we have all the recordings. Is that when there's an issue of interest or, um, or concern, uh, my question has more to do with the uh, exposure of the entire community to this right. rather than yeah. just those who happen to be in the room. Right, and I, and I actually think that goes to a broader point, which is obviously Greece is a is a heavily Christian town, but there, even in a heavily Christian town, there are likely plenty of people who have other beliefs about religion. They may not always be as vocal, in part because, you know, I think as Linda and Susan can speak to when you raise your voice about these things. Some people get angry and, and you know, push back, to say the least. But um, but your point is a good one. There's someone either watching or attending, in all likelihood, and as we found out in this case, who has different views about religion. And, and that's why local government shouldn't simply assume, well, this is a Christian community, so it's OK if we do exclusively Christian prayers. Right. I live in the town of Greece, and I'm frequently one of the very few people that's at a town board meeting. Mm -hmm. And what I'm curious about is if the town abided by the decision that's already been made, what what would that prayer look like? Would they not hear prayer? Would they have to be non-denominational prayer? Or would they just have to, again, like invite some token members from other denominations? Uh, the, the question was, let's assume that the Supreme Court hadn't taken the case or that in any event they're required to comply with the Court of Appeals decision in the meantime, what would the remedy look like? In other words, what would the town have to do to shape up and bring itself into compliance with the law? Um, I say that's an interesting question, actually, because the Court of Appeals, although they concluded that what the town had been doing violated the Constitution, the Court of Appeals actually didn't order a specific remedy. Rather, they sent it back to the trial court for the trial court to craft an order consistent with the court's ruling. Um, and in fact, one of, the, one of the bases on which we opposed the Supreme Court's review, we told the Supreme Court, actually, this is premature because we actually don't even know what the remedy is going to be yet. Um, obviously, the Supreme Court felt it was mature enough. But um, <laughs> I think there, given what the Court of Appeals said, I mean, the Court of Appeals made clear that the town is allowed to pray. And so certainly one way they could bring themselves into compliance would be to simply have all its prayers be non-denominational. Um, or silence. The, or a moment of silence or, or anything like that. Um, the Court of Appeals did suggest that some references to other religions would not per se be a violation. But I think the overall um, crux of the decision is you would have to have either, you know, you'd have to have meaningful diversity you would have to have town, you know, town officials make clear that they were not, not, not be taking affirmative steps to affiliate themselves with those prayer givers. Um, but that's one of the things we haven't had a chance to be, do yet. I mean, even if we win in the Supreme Court is, at that point, it'll go back down to the trial court and there will be a crafting of remedy. And what the Court of Appeals decision suggested is there's a couple of different ways the town could bring itself into compliance. Greece had contracted with a cable company, and all of those uh, were are videoed and then shown over one of the, the local, you know, that as we all have city, town, educational channels, and those were all those were all broadcast <coughs> on cable. Thank you. 
as we know, um, the Supreme Court was originally white male Protestant, and primarily was Protestant, and has been Protestant, dominated by Protestants up until Sotomayor and, and Kagan, and now it's, it's, I believe, six Catholics and three, three Jews. And some analysts have suggested that, that that's a factor, that this will be the first Supreme Court case heard by a Supreme Court that is not a, a Protestant, a dominated by Protestants. But there are no Protestants on the court. And that because these are two religions that have, have, been, uh, have suffered discrimination in our country, the Catholics and, and Jews, that that may have an influence. Now, and I'm wondering if you think that that's a factor, that the, the personal religions, and because it's those two religions, is a factor, or is that just analysts looking for something? Probably a little of both. I mean, the, I mean, say as a general matter, the religious views of a justice don't necessarily mean anything. I mean, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Scalia are both Catholics. I think, you know, I don't think just, Justice Sotomayor hasn't heard an establishment clause case yet, but I think it's fair to say that their approach to those cases are going to be extremely different, notwithstanding their religion. Uh, you know, to give examples from the past, Justice, Justice William Brennan, who's, you know, probably a liberal hero justice, was a devout Catholic, thought abortion was profoundly morally wrong, yet, you know, played it a, a central role in recognizing the right to choose hated the media, yet wrote all these decisions protecting you know, freedom, of, freedom of the press, refused to hire women, yet was instrumental in these decisions, um, you know, recognizing the protections of women. All of which is to say, to some extent, you know, I think to some extent there's a limit to, um, to how a justice's religious beliefs affect their decision making. You know, that said, I, I think the one thing is, I think, more, I'd say, I guess, more diversity on a body, a government body, a court, et cetera, is always better, I would say, because um, I think it just sort of makes you more empathetic, to use sort of a taboo word when talking about judges, empathetic to, the, to what is faced by people not of the majority religion. And it's interesting, too, with Catholics and Jews, because um, you know, certainly there's great history of discrimination against Jews and Catholics, both in the United States and elsewhere, although in the last, you know, couple of decades, I would say, well, certainly it's not gone away. At the same time, um, both, you know, members of both religions have sort of achieved a lot of prominence and power in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, one of the cases that Kaylin mentioned in, in introducing me, the Medina Valley School District case, that was a case where most of the unlawful religious promotion and coercion was actually uh, being done by people that happened to be Catholic. And so, I guess the long and the short of it is, I think it's complicated. I think someone's religious beliefs don't necessarily impact how they're going to decide their cases, but it certainly affects people's worldview. And I think certainly if you are, um, you know, an orthodox or very conservative practitioner of a particular religion, um, that may influence your views, especially if your religion is now more or less a member of the majority, so, or a member of the majority. Can you actually characterize the makeup and size of the quote unquote minority of religious makeup of the town of Greece? And two, does it matter? Um, and, well, I might have another question, but. So, no, no, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, the point of the Bill of Rights, and in this case, the Establishment Clause, is to protect minorities of all sorts, and in the case of the Establishment Clause, religious minorities. Um, the fact that, and I'm making these numbers up, but if it's the case that 99.999999% of the town is not only Christian, but practices the exact same denomination of Christianity, that almost makes it more important that um, you know, protections for the minority are in place because they've got, you know, you know, it's, they're dealing with sort of an overwhelming group of people who feel a certain thing. So, no, I think the, the point of the amendments is to protect minorities. Majorities, the thinking is, will always be able to protect themselves through the political process. Um, and so ulti ultimately, in our view, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Let me <coughs> add. 
I, I think the town is arguing that it matters in terms of providing an explanation for why the makeup of the prayers has been what it is. In other words, what the town's saying is, look, we're not discriminating. It's not our fault that most of the clergy in the town are Christian, and of course they're going to deliver Christian prayers. And so I think that's their, um, that's part of their explanation for why the, the makeup has been what, what it has been. But I think even then it doesn't excuse an argument. There's a difference between a Christian prayer giver and a Christian <coughs> prayer giver delivering a Christian prayer. A you know, Christian chaplain can give a perfectly non-denominational um, blessing and so the fact that the town is heavily Christian and that the clergy in the town is even more heavily Christian doesn't, in our view, excuse the town from nonetheless having an inclusive presentation. Um, with the town of Greece, either they're somewhere between being actively discriminating against a minority or they're uh, oblivious to the fact that they are and that there's some concern there. In cases like this, where there is an outcome where, the, where a legislative body is forced to change their prayers, um, how has that affected, have they been able to internalize the inclusiveness? Um, do you have any idea? <laughs> 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 come to Greece. Come to Greece. You know, they change their prayers. You know, I hate to answer another question, it depends, but I, mean, I am a lawyer, so that's kind of how we answer questions. <laughs> but I, I mean, I do think it depends. I think for some people, give an analogy similar, you know, when, when, when all of a sudden more people started to realize that they knew gay people and gay couples, and more states started to allow gay marriage, you saw like, gay, you know, gay people got married and like, oh, it's no big deal. Like, you know, the earth hasn't ended. Like, you know, people didn't turn into beasts. It was just like, oh yeah, it's fine. It's like we're back to normal. And so, in that respect, you know, I think for some people, it's probably the case that you have more diversity and you realize, oh, this is fine. And wow, there actually are, there is actually more religious diversity than I realized. You know, I think for other people, um, you know, if you really believe this is a Christian nation and and, and that's it, then I think um, you know, a court order telling you to do something is likely to produce a lot of resentment. I mean, I, I also think there is, I mean, again, I don't know if that's the case here, but there is certainly a strain to, we're an organization based in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, I read a letter, my last name is Lipper, you can draw whatever conclusions from about my religious beliefs you know, that you want to from that. And, and I do think in some cases there is resentment that, you know, these outsiders from Washington are coming into our communities and telling us what to do. Um, so I think that's part of it as well. I mean, I do think in, you know, in response to that, we say, look, we don't, we rarely write a letter or raise a complaint without someone from that community coming to us. And so I think um, you know, that's maybe less of a, a real concern. But, but I think there is a view, you know, I've certainly seen it in my cases, where it's that, who are these lawyers from Washington, D.C. coming into our community and telling us? <laughs> how to open our meetings, or how to you know, schedule our high school graduation, or, or, or et cetera. So I think there's part of it. So I think over time, it does have an effect of highlighting greater diversity, which I think is benefits in the long run. In the short term, I think it very much depends on sort of the individual psychology of the person being told what to do. I wanted to point out that as a longtime resident of Greece and an observer of Greece, politics and actions. I wonder if it's a coincidence that Greece has had a lot more problems in their town government <laughs> since they've introduced the problem of starting their So the, the question was... <laughs> the question was, is it a coincidence that since the town introduced prayers that the government has had more problems? The answer is I have no comment. <laughs>